Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shop and welcome to another Bookish Breakfast. Um, except this one should probably be called Bookish Brunch or even Bookish Lunch because I think it's about half past one so it's going on a little bit in the day. Um, so I've spent most of the last week in London. I was finishing the essay that I've been mentioning probably on a weekly basis for the last, I don't know, eight weeks at least. Um, so I stayed in an Airbnb for like four nights and just spent every day in the library working um, on this essay. But it's handed in now, so it's done. Um, so I haven't done a huge amount of actual reading in that time apart from of like academic papers. Um, the thing that I did do was I kept listening to my audiobook. So I was listening to The Two Towers. Brought the book so I'd be able to hold something up. I was listening to The Two Towers, I finished The Two Towers and I actually um, got far enough through The Return of the King that I'm basically, I'm into the phase of all of the endings where the book just keeps ending but forever. Um, so yeah I'm trying, gonna try not to go on to too many um, tangents about this. I went a little bit t tangential last week um, with the Lord of the Rings stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, saying I was going to try and not go on to any tangents, the things I have to say are literally just tangents. So um, as I was working on my essay, I had a lot of like slightly bored mind space. Like I really enjoyed the essay writing process, but you know, when you're sat working on something, there's always like that little extra bit of your mind that is trying to think about something else. And I kept coming up with little like what if, what, what if questions, sorry, um, about situations in Middle Earth. So um, one of my favourite ones that I was speculating about was uh, what if the Shire held a referendum on whether or not to stay in Middle Earth? Like obviously geographically, like they couldn't physically remove the Shire from Middle Earth, so the Shire would still be in Middle Earth. But what if they, they voted to like, oh, we're not going to have anything to do with outside problems, which is essentially what they do. That's the way that people in the Shire live. Um, so how would they vote? They like collectively the Shire would obviously vote leave but thinking about the the hobbits that we know um Bilbo I'm thinking that this is in some point like between Bilbo's first adventure and Frodo's adventure so maybe after Bilbo's moved to Rivendell so B Bilbo's moved to Rivendell he's disenfranchised he is not able to vote on whether to leave or to remain um Frodo would obviously vote remain because he he loves the like the outside world stuff and he's obviously been influenced by Bilbo enough and he he kind of knows the importance of the outside world um Merry and Pippin I'm not entirely sure about this but I think they would probably vote leave because I don't think that they've had enough exposure to the world beyond the Shire's bounds at the point of before the start of their adventures. Um, I don't think they know enough about the world outside Middle Earth um, to, to have any reason to vote Remain. So I think that they would just go with the normal Shire mentality um, and want to like leave and ignore all of the, the problems that go on in the wider world. Um, and Sam, actually, I had a lot of thought about Sam because Sam's gaffer would definitely, definitely vote leave. Like he's very much like, oh, who are these outsiders um, and all of that. Um, but Sam really, even from the start of the book, before he's gone out anywhere, he loves the elves and he loves stories about the elves and he loves the like, the adventurous stories that get passed down to him. So I think Sam, and he obviously, he also would be strongly influenced by Frodo because he's got this kind of like loyalty and passion for Frodo, um, love basically. Um, so I think he would be influenced by if Frodo said, no, 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 we should vote for Remain, um, Sam would probably vote Remain. Um, and I think because of his love of the elves as well, I think Sam would vote Remain. Obviously by the end of the whole um, adventure scenario, Merry and Pippin would also vote Remain. But I think the Shire as a whole would be even more annoyed by all of the problems that they'd experienced because of this whole weird stuff that was going on elsewhere in Middle-earth. And they would be even more strongly voting leave despite the... Um, protection that they get from other characters and then I think if the Shire did vote leave they would upset a lot of people because the elves would be like well we only really stay in Middle Earth to look after people like you and the Dunedain would be like well we're here like guarding your borders but why should we be guarding your borders if you're telling us to leave so yeah I think that that could have some interesting ramifications and I do think the Shire it's the kind of thing that somebody in the Shire would think of as a good idea because they kind of have this mentality that they can shut themselves out from the rest of the wider world which is obviously just not how a world system works. Anyway, so that's obviously just the influence of 
British politics on my thinking at the moment. Um, so yeah, what if the Hobbits voted leave? Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about that one. And the other one that, um, as I was finishing The Two Towers, um, potential slight spoilers here, so maybe skip ahead a couple of minutes. Um, so what if, obviously at the end of The Two Towers, um, Sam thinks that Frodo is, um, I'm going to assume that if you wanted to skip, you skip now. Um, Sam thinks that Frodo's dead, um, and he takes the ring and he decides to carry on with the quest, but then he overhears the orcs say that Frodo isn't actually dead. And I was thinking, what would happen if Sam was just a couple of paces further along at that point and he didn't hear anybody say that Frodo was still alive? Like, how would that impact on the events in The Return of the King? Um, would Sam be able to continue the quest? Would he be able to complete the quest? Um, because pretty much the first thing, he gets the ring, pretty much the first thing he does with it is he puts it on. And Frodo hasn't done that for a very long time at this stage. Um, so I found that quite interesting. Um, even though I don't view, character, view Sam as a character who is likely to be very susceptible to the ring, um, like in his like emotional position of being bereaved over Frodo and, and all of that stuff, would he be like vulnerable to um, sort of exploitation by the power of the ring, or would he? Would his loyalty to Frodo inspire his grief, carry him forward to be able to complete the quest? Um, and also, how other characters would respond. Like, for instance, Gollum. If Gollum didn't know, or Smeagol, um, if Smeagol didn't know that Sam had the ring, I think he would have done what Sam does and gone and found Frodo and like liberated him but then what would he do when he realized that Frodo didn't have the ring would he he probably would just go straight after Sam but what would happen to Frodo would Frodo go after Sam or would Frodo go back um towards Minas Tirith then what would happen if he did anyway yeah spent a lot of time thinking about that um I think that would be like a, a great fan fiction I assume somebody will have done that at some point in the last like 50 years um somebody will have written out that alternative en ending so yes, yeah, so that was some things that I was thinking about related to <laughs> The Lord of the Rings. Um, and I have been really enjoying uh, revisiting this story. Um, what else was I going to say about The Lord of the Rings? Can't really remember. Anyway, so that's that. Um, and then, so like I said, I was working on my essay and I finished it and I handed it in and it's done. Um, so while I was there, um, as another way of entertaining myself, um, because I was all on my own and spending like 10 hours a day in the library. Um, I took some pictures and filmed some short clips and I was thinking of doing a study vlog. So I might potentially put together a little like five minute study vlog. Um, but I'm not sure whether that would just be a completely frivolous waste of time. Because I knew as I was filming the clips like, oh this is a waste of time and this is a little bit ridiculous. But I kind of did it to give myself more like entertainment and motivation to keep going of like, oh well I want to like be able to get to the next stage. Um, so I don't know whether or not I'll put that into effect. Um, but I did really enjoy the studying process and I really enjoyed the reading of the academic articles. And every time that I've done um, some like study project, I get to the end and I think I want to keep learning things. I want to keep um, doing academic stuff even when I'm not forced to do it by a course and obviously I've got exams coming up in January so there's, I'm not at the end of a course yet and then in January I'm starting a new course um, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be on an academic pathway for the next year at least um, but I was trying to think of a way that I could push myself to read like say just a journal article every week because I always say to myself oh if I read an article every week then I'd learn something new and I'd kind of challenge myself and, and find out interesting things and the thing is with them um, like when you write an essay, you read loads of articles and I always have like a whole page of notes where of like um, critiques and like, oh, well, this would be interesting. This thing needs these, it would be interesting to find out more about this aspect and all of that, like so many thoughts. And then when you put that article in as a reference in your essay, you're lucky if you get like a sentence of like, oh, this data is questionable. Um, and you don't really get to say all of the things that you have to say about it. So I'd like to be able to have some kind of way of like reading articles and then actually um, having the time to to properly think about them um, that they don't just get like kind of all of them get binned at the end um, so I've been thinking about like ways I could do that but I haven't really decided on what approach would be best for that um, and it, it's really worth doing I think it is worth doing but whether I would motivate myself to do it is another issue so anyway I came to the end of the essay writing process um, and all of this time that I've been spending in the library of the, the university or the school where I've been studying, um, in all that time I noticed that there was a book swap shelf 
um, near the entrance um, of the library. Um, and it had a sign on saying, please take a book. And obviously when you're working on an essay, you're always thinking about things that you'd rather be doing. I, like I say again, I really enjoyed the, the process, but I was also kind of having this, oh, I'd like to do such and such else um, at the same time. So I was sit, sat there working thinking, I'd really like to take a book from the book swap shelves. Um, and I kind of wanted to give myself a little like, prize at the end of com the completion, you know, like reward thing. Um, so finally on the on the last day um, when I'd um, handed it in and then I had all of the lectures yesterday as well for the course. So after the last lecture I went up to the library desk and I was like, is it possible to take a book from the book swap if you don't have a book to give in to the book swap? And to my amazement and surprise she was like, oh yeah, like please do because we're running out of space for all of them. <laughs> so I went to the book swap shelves and it's kind of got the problem that book swap shelves often have in that people don't put their favourite books onto book swap shelves unless they want to spread the word about their favourite book. So they tend to be ones that people have no real desire to hang on to. So there weren't that many books that I found particularly interesting. There was like The Moonstone, but I've already read The Moonstone and I have a copy of it and things like that. So the one book that was there that is one that I have actively wanted to read for a, a while um, was The Casual Vacancy by J.K. Rowling. Um, and I've, I've really wanted to read this since I kind of found out about it. I saw the adaptation of it and really enjoyed it and found it very interesting. Um, and so I thought this would be a perfect, like, light but entertaining read to have after a period of, like, dense hard work. Um, so yeah, so I picked that up and I started reading it on the train and I have also been reading it this morning, so I've made a little dent in it. So I've got some thoughts about it, of course. Um, so basically it's a book about an entire community. Um, it's a book about um, this little town of Pagford, this very English, um, bigoted little town basically. It's, it's such a typical English spot. Um, and one of the confusing factors about it is it is about an entire community. So there's a, a massive cast of characters and it can sometimes be a little bit confusing to think, oh, is that character just somebody who's been referenced before or are they somebody who we've had like a, a chapter from their perspective before or just trying to sort out all of these different characters. So I think it's going to take a while to get into that and get to like properly comprehend um, who everybody is in that. Um, but I am enjoying it. And what I enjoy about this massive cast of characters is that every character who is introduced one of the first things that we find out about them is where they live, what street do they live on, and what kind of house is is it on their street? Like, what, what, when were these houses built? Like, there, there's the 1930s bungalows, there's the old Victorian houses, there's the um, terrace that used to be labourers' houses, um, there, and there's, a, there's an estate as well, there's the Fields estate, um, and every character is, like, tied to where they come from, and I think that for what I know that she's trying to do with this book, that's such a brilliant detail and like it's it's more than a detail, it's 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 vital to the story is, is where each character comes from. And I think it's quite I don't know about other countries because I've not really lived in other countries, but I think it's a very British thing to look at where somebody comes from and make a judgment based on it. And this book is all about kind of um, prejudices and judgments that are made about people and expectations that you have of people. Um, based on their origins. So it's a lot about classism, I think, um, so far. Um, and from what I saw in the adaptation, it's a lot about like, yeah, social, social conditions, social, social positioning, um, and status and like local politics and things like that, um, related to people's origins and like the value that we put on different people from different origins. And I think it's so relevant. It, it was relevant in 2012 when it was written. I think it's relevant now to the um, political and electoral situations that we have um, and I think it's very relevant culturally because like I, I work in a hospital and I've seen on multiple occasions um, people in hospitals that say for instance you've got a new admission you know nothing about this new admission but you've got their name and their address and I've seen frequently people will look at an address and say oh they're from this place so we know what they're gonna be like or you know like oh well that's a nice place to be from like but people making judgments and forming expectations of a person just based on their postcode or the one sentence of their address. Um, and I think like there are a lot of problems with a lot of different prejudices um, in Britain and in the NHS and it, it, it comes up a lot that people um, have um, 
unpleasant and inaccurate beliefs about people um, based on background, but it comes up more with things like this because people don't know that they shouldn't do it, um, if that makes sense. Like, everyone knows that they shouldn't say things that come across as racist, if that makes sense. Like, everyone... Um, so if somebody's holding a belief that is racist, they will try to phrase it in a way that makes it sound better than it is, um, if that makes sense. Um, whereas if somebody is dismissing somebody because of the estate that they grew up on, they think that that's okay. Um, and people don't, don't hold back from that kind of prejudice because um, they just see it as accepted and normal. And yeah, it's just not um, something that is challenged sufficiently. So. I think it's going to be really interesting to read an entire book that kind of like looks at that issue um, and examines it a little bit. The one thing that I would say is that I think that JK Rowling is absolutely brilliant for coming up with ideas and creating stories and plots and characters. Um, like her characterization in this so far and in the Harry Potter series is really spot on. The thing that lets her down is the words on the page and it's the same through all of her works, it's the actual words that she uses um, to describe these characters and to describe these events. They're just not quite as good as they should be and it's kind of hard to put your finger on why they aren't. But in the, the hands of an excellent writer, this book would have been like a very, very, very high quality, I think. I think the, the themes of it, it reminds me of something like To Kill a Mockingbird or something, the themes of it are important and broadly applicable um, but also pertinent to a certain place in time. And I think that's like key ingredients for a good book, but the actual words are just not that great. So it, it's just this interesting kind of divide of just not quite being as good as it should be. Um, so anyway, so I hope I'm gonna enjoy the rest of that. And it definitely, it's engaging. It's got me wanting to read more of it. Um, so yeah. And other than that, this week I've just been kind of being excited about future reading plans and things that I'm gonna read. Um, we're leading up to the end of the year, trying to meet some of the year challenges that I set myself for 2018, um, 2019, I know what year it is, um, and thinking about things that I'm going to read in 2020, so that's been quite fun, and I might talk a little bit more about that another time. But so far, this has already been a good stretch of time, so have a lovely week. Thank you for watching, and let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts on any of these things, and I will speak to you soon. Bye!